The actual steam engine on a locomotive includes cylinders, valves, and valve gear. Here, too, many developments made their mark. Once locomotives were fitted with superheaters, slide valves could no longer cope with the temperatures involved and gave way to piston valves. With steam pressures increasing, piston valves also operated with less resistance. Steam distribution involved the valve events in the steam chest and the valve gear motion. Admission and release of steam were handled by the valve in the steam chest above the cylinder. This sectioned Prussian Express locomotive features piston valves. The piston valve contains a rod fitted with two pistons. The space between the pistons is occupied by fresh steam from the boiler. The outer ends are connected to the exhaust steam passages going to the blast pipe and chimney. Let's observe one side of the cylinder. Steam is admitted into the cylinder just before the piston reaches dead end. The admission continues through part of the new stroke. The enclosed steam works on expansion through the rest of the stroke. Exhaust ports open just before the piston reaches the other end and continues throughout virtually the entire return stroke. Then admission starts again just before dead end and a new stroke. The procedure is the same on the other side of the piston. The admission of steam can be cut off when the piston has traveled three quarters or 75% of its stroke. This is referred to as 75% cutoff. The locomotive runs more economically with less admission and more expansion. To reduce cutoff, the travel of the piston valve is reduced. It is increased to increase cutoff. But with this valve gear, the driver cannot change the position of the piston valve when this side of the locomotive is a dead center. Forward or reverse are determined by the position of the radius rod in the expansion link. All the way down is full forward gear and all the way up is full reverse. The midpoint is neutral, meaning the locomotive will not start. All other positions lie between admission and expansion. This side of the locomotive stands at dead center. Whatever the driver does, under these conditions, the position of the piston valve cannot be changed. It means that admission at dead center positions is always the same so-called lead. Steam is already being admitted before the piston reaches dead end. The idea behind this is to cushion the speeding piston and to have full pressure acting upon it at the beginning of a new stroke. This is the machinery of a 210 German class 52 freight engine in which the cylinder power is matched by high adhesion weight to grip the rails. 
This locomotive has the common Valchert valve gear fitted, designed by the Belgian engineer Egide Valchert in 1844 and independently invented again in 1849 by Heusinger von Waldeg. A return crank is fitted to the main driver. The eccentric rod moves the expansion link back and forth. The valve is driven through the radius rod by the expansion link. The lower half of the expansion link is forward running, the upper half is reverse. Note how the driver increases cutoff. The vertical combination lever adjusts the motion of the valve stem in such a way that at dead center position, as mentioned earlier, the valve always provides the same lead. The valve gear is put in full reverse. After just a few turns of the drive wheels, the cutoff is shortened. The drawback of slide valves and piston valves is that they only partially open the ports when running at short cutoffs. Both the superheated steam and the strongly cooled exhaust steam use the same port. Superheated steam is cooled slightly and exhaust steam is slightly heated. For these reasons, the Austrian 32132 has poppet valves fitted. Whatever the system, Lenz, Caprotti or Franklin, they all work with separated admission and exhaust ports. This can be discerned from the two bumps on the valve chest. Poppet valves open quickly and completely, even when running on short cutoffs. The Austrian class 12 284s were infamous for their loud barking exhaust caused by a slightly too large exhaust valve typically opening too soon. Most steam locomotives possess two outside cylinders. The Swedish E1090 has two inside cylinders which provide a more balanced ride. But the ride would be even better if the locomotive had four cylinders. This is such a four-cylinder. Two crossheads on this side, the left side of the locomotive, move in exactly the opposite direction. The cranks on the driving axle are set half a turn or 180 degrees apart. The same is true for the right side 
although this duo is also set 90 degrees apart from the left side. In this way, one side of the locomotive is always in a good position to start. In this case, the work of two large cylinders is done by four smaller cylinders driving lighter connecting rods. The pistons move two by two in opposite directions, providing almost perfect balance. Two valve gears suffice to operate four valves. The motion of the outside valve stem is transferred to the adjacent valve stem in reverse order because the machinery is phased at an 180 degree interval. Still, the four-cylinder layout did not gain general acceptance. A crank axle such as this one from the Dutch 3700 class is a complicated and expensive part to make. The crank was occasionally the weak spot prone to hairline fractures. Here we also see the eccentrics that drive the valve gear. Oiling a multi-cylinder locomotive is not fun. Considerable dexterity is needed to cope with cramped conditions between the frames. It gets even worse when repairs are needed. This view is inside the frames of the German three-cylinder 01-1075. The three-cylinder layout meant some advantages of the four-cylinder, whilst avoiding pitfalls of the two-cylinder. The inside cylinder connects to the first driver set. One crank suffices and can be of stout construction. The 01-1075 has one inside valve gear set and two outside. A small eccentric crank on the second driver set drives the inner valve gear. This small crank can be avoided by a third return crank outside. The Slovakian 486007 features two return cranks on the left side. The first one operates the left side valve gear. The second one operates the expansion link under the boiler. Three-cylinder locomotives produce a different sound from two or four-cylinder locomotives because there are six beats instead of four per revolution. The 101075 clearly sounded off-beat. The setting of valves, however, is not done by ear, but rather in a scientific trial and error process using special indicators. While the locomotive runs back and forth, the indicators draw a pressure diagram on a roll of paper. The valve stems are then adjusted and the process is repeated until the settings are correct.
steam escapes from the indicator with every power stroke from the front side of the piston. Once the valves are set, a trial run is made with the restored locomotive to check all functions. This narrow gauge locomotive of the Epstahlbahn in Austria shows a small cylinder on the left and a large one on the right. This is not an ordinary two-cylinder, but a two-cylinder compound. In single expansion locomotives, steam enters the cylinders only once and is then exhausted. Compound locomotives work with double expansion and use the steam twice. Compound locomotives, especially superheated ones, have achieved the highest economy in fuel and water consumption. Note the peculiar valve gear, which has much in common with the American Baker gear. When starting, the low-pressure cylinder does not receive steam from the high-pressure cylinder. The locomotive might get stuck in dead center position. Therefore, a limited amount of live steam is admitted to the low-pressure side until the locomotive has gained enough momentum. The very first compound by Anatole Mallet was also a two-cylinder design. The small tank engine first ran in 1876 between Bayonne and Biarritz in the southwest of France. A two-cylinder compound at speed sounds slow. Only two exhaust beats per revolution are audible. The best known compounds in Europe all had four cylinders. A nice example is the Bavarian S36, built by Kraus Maffei in Munich. This view clearly shows the small high-pressure cylinders inside and the large low-pressure cylinders outside. The inside cylinders are placed high up over an angle so the connecting rods clear the first driver axle. The pistons and rods move in a similar fashion to the single expansion four-cylinder.
Live steam is admitted to the small, high-pressure cylinders first. The partially expanded steam then flows through the receiver into the low-pressure cylinders for additional expansion. Only then is the steam exhausted. A limited amount of live steam is admitted to the low-pressure cylinders to start the engine. The soft exhaust makes for a relatively quiet locomotive. Finally, we introduce a French de Glenne compound. In contrast to the Bavarian compound, the 241A65 has high pressure cylinders outside and the big low pressure cylinders inside. The low pressure cylinders are placed well forward to power the first driver set. Each cylinder has its own valve gear and all four sets are divided into two groups. The cutoffs for the high and low pressure group may be adjusted independently for optimum and equal performance of both groups. The second regulator allows the driver to add some live steam in the low-pressure group at will. French drivers must have been real wizards. <laughs> 